He was just a few yards away from me, standing at rigid attention in a uniform just like the one I now wore. My father, Xavier Ulysses Lightman, living and breathing, and smiling. He was smiling at me, with my own smile, an older version of my face. The man standing in front of me could have passed for my time-traveling future self, come back to warn me of our shared destiny. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Meadows Aethid escort Debbie through a pair of armored doors at the opposite end of the hangar. Chen, Milo, and Wody were waiting for them just inside the tunnel on the other side, along with an EDA officer I didn't recognize who had a Japanese flag on his uniform. The entire group gaped at us through the open airlock doors until the door slammed shut again a second later with a dull thud that echoed through the vast hangar. I was only vaguely aware of their departure or of my new surroundings because all of my senses were now acutely focused on my father, the paternal ghost whose absence had haunted my entire adolescence now stood before me, miraculously resurrected. I found myself staring at a drop of sweat that had formed on his brow and then watched as it trickled down the side of his face as if this detail were proof that this were really happening. It made me think of a scene in the original Total Recall, another movie I knew by heart because he'd owned it, on, he'd owned it a copy on VHS. I took a long look at him while he did the same to me. As I drank in the details of my long-lost father's face, my first-hand familiarity with his features made it easy for me to text the fear he was trying to conceal. He looked older than I'd expected, but that was probably because he'd never been older than 19 in every photo I'd ever seen of him. I think a part of me was also subconsciously hoping that when I saw him it would appear that he hadn't aged at all, because the EDA had, had frozen him in carbonite or subjected him to light-speed time dilation to keep him young for the, com for the coming war. No such luck. He would be 37 now, the same age as my mother. But unlike her, he looked a decade older than his real age, instead of a decade younger. He still appeared to be in excellent physical condition, but his once dark hair was now shot through with gray, and there, was this, and there were prominent crow's feet around his eyes, which were the exact same shade of blue as my own. A hardened weariness seemed to permeate his features, and I wondered if I was getting the first glimpse of what my face would look like if I somehow lived to be his age. I was still wondering that when I realized he was already moving towards me, closing the narrow distance between us, and then his arms were suddenly wrapped around me. A dam ruptured somewhere in my chest, and a torrent of feelings came rushing out of me all at once. I buried my face against him, and this triggled, triggered a long dormant sense of memory, the sensation of my father holding me just like this when I was still an infant. It may have even been my memory of the very last time he held me before he'd vanished from my life forever. No, not forever, I told myself, until right now. I'm so happy to see you, Zach, he whispered, with a slight tremor in his voice. And I'm sorry, so sorry for leaving you and your mother. I never imagined that I would be gone for so long. Each word he spoke made my heart swell until it felt as if it might burst. In one breath, my father had just said all the things I dreamed of hearing him tell me back when I'd still allowed myself to familiar fantasize about him still being alive and that, and I was too overwhelmed to respond. Part of me was still sure that all of this was some sort of precarious dream and that I and that I said or did something and that if I said or did something wrong I would wake up now at the worst possible time I tried to speak again to tell him I'd been dreaming of this moment my entire life but I still couldn't find my voice my father seemed to take to take my continued silence as a negative sign he let go of me and stepped back then began to study my face trying to decipher whatever dazed expression he saw there I've been waiting 18 years to tell you all of that, Zach, he said quietly. I've been, I've practiced saying it in my head a million times. I hope I got it right. I hope I didn't screw it up. Absurdly, I found myself wishing my, that my mother were here so she could introduce me to this complete stranger who was wearing my face. 
You didn't, I finally managed to say, nearly inaudible. Then I cleared my throat and tried again. You didn't screw it up, I said cautiously. I'm happy to see you, too. My father exhaled. I'm relieved to hear that, he said. I wasn't sure you would be, he smiled nervously. You have every right to be angry. And I know you've got a temper, so... He stopped speaking when he saw my smile vanish. Then he winced and contorted his brow. The exact same way I did when I said something and instantly regretted it. How could you possibly know that I've got a temper? I asked, the anger rising in my voice like mercury. My father laughed involuntarily at the irony of my response, but it was, last, but it was lost on me, and his reaction only made me feel even more hurt and pissed off. Somehow, all of the excitement and euphoria I'd felt upon meeting him had just dissipated in the span of a few seconds. What makes you think you know anything about me at all? I'm sorry, Zach, but I'm your new commanding officer. I read your EDA recruit profile. It contains all of your civilian school and police records. All of my private psych evaluation results, too, I bet. He nodded. The EDA finds out everything they can about potential recruits. Did my recruit profile mention that my anger management issues might be linked to the tragic death of my father in a ship factory explosion when I was 10 months old? The question clearly hurt him, but I couldn't help but twist the knife a little farther. What do you think it was like for me growing up believing that's how my father died? And having everyone in the whole town believe it too. Were you trying to ruin my life? Couldn't you have pretended to die in a fucking car accident or something instead? He opened his mouth and then closed it a few times before he managed to form any words. It wasn't like I had a choice, son. It had to be an explosion so that the body couldn't be identified. They buried a John Doe in my place. He met my gaze. I'm sorry. I was a kid myself at the time. I didn't really understand what I was agreeing to and to give up. He stood. We stood there, staring at each other in silence for a moment. Then my father's cue com beeped. He glanced down at its display with a frown, then turned back to me. We need to get up to operations and get you and the other new arrivals briefed, but we'll have a chance to talk more privately later on, okay? I nodded mutely. I'd waited this long. And what choice did I really have? My father removed a small silver object from his pocket. He said, here, pressing it into, my, into the palm of my hand. This is for you. I turned it over. It was a USB flash drive with an EDA emblem stamped on its casing. What's on it? Letters mostly, he said. I wrote you and your mom every single day I was up here. I noticed that he was shifting his weight from one foot to the other while he spoke, another one of my own nervous tics. I hope they will help explain why I made the decision I did and how hard it's been for me to live with every se ever since. He shrugged, still avoiding my gauge, gaze. Sorry there are so many. You probably won't have ta enough time to read them all. His voice faltered and he turned away. Uh, to hide his face. I glanced down at the flash drive and then closed my fist around it protectively, a nerve that so small an object could, to could hold such priceless contents. My father raised the cue com on his wrist and tapped a series of icons on its display. There was a metallic clank as a row of short storage compartment doors built on the underside of the shuttle's fuselage slid open, revealing a cube-shaped shipping containers. My father whispered a series of commands into his cue com, and a few seconds later, a team of four Aethids disengaged from the nearby charging rack and marched single-filed over to the shuttle. Three, do three of the drones began to unload cargo, while the fourth climbed into the passenger cabin to retrieve our backpacks. Ready, Lieutenant? My father asked, nodding toward the exit. Yes, sir, I replied, slipping the flash drive into my uniform's breast pocket so that it rested directly over my heart. Then, together, we continued across the hangar, 
and I finally widened my focus enough to take in the details of my surreal surroundings. The moon base Alpha Bay hangar was a breathtaking sight. The curved war walls of the armored dome around us were lined with hundreds of gleaming interceptor drones arrayed in the belt fed launch racks that would fire them out into space like bullets from a high velocity gas powered machine gun. These were the drones we had been brought up here to pilot, I realized. We would use these very ships to wage war with the enemy when they arrived here just over five and a half hours from now. In that moment, I felt like Luke Skywalker surveying the hangar full of A, Y, and X-Wing fighters just before the Battle of Yavin, or Captain Apollo climbing into the cockpit of his Viper on Galactica's flight deck, Ender Wigan arriving at battle school, or Alex Rogan clutching his Star League uniform, staring wide-eyed at a hangar full of gun stars. But this wasn't a fantasy. I wasn't Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon or Ender Wigan or anyone else. This was my real life. I, Zachary Ulysses Lightman, an 18-year-old kid from Beaverton, Oregon, newly recruited by the Earth Defense Alliance, had just been recruited with my long-lost father on the far side of the moon. And now, together, we were going to wage a desperate battle to prevent the destruction of Earth and save the human race from total annihilation. If this were all just a dream, I wasn't sure I would want it to end. But it was going to end, and soon, because there was an egg timer strapped to my forearm count counting off exactly just how many hours, minutes, and seconds remained until my rude awakening. When my father reached the exit, he continued walking through the open airlock doors into the tube-shaped access tunnel beyond, which, if the layout of this place was identical to its virtual counterpart in Armada as it seemed, led beneath the lunar surface to the adjacent Daedalus B crater, where the rest of the base was located. But I stopped just shy of the exit and turned back to take another look at the thousands of interceptors racked into the curved dome wall around me and at the automated drone assembly plants at its far end. Their matter compilers and nanobots worked even now to construct more ADI-88s which they would probably never have time to finish if what Vance had told me about the alien speed was true. I winced as another wave of shame washed over me at the memory of my colossal screw-up at Crystal Palace and the hangar full of drones it had cost us. But then I recalled one of the final images from the EDA film, briefing film of the European Armada, a massive deadly ring of warships encircling the icy moon all now headed for Earth. Those drones we had lost at Crystal Palace wouldn't have made any difference, nor would all the drones here or stockpiled back on Earth. My father saw me lingering inside the hangar and ran back to fetch me. What's wrong, Zach? I laughed out loud at the absurdity of his question. What's wrong? I repeated. Gee, let me think now. We need to get moving, Lieutenant. He said, there isn't much time. But I didn't move. My father waited. I turned to study his face and asked him the question I needed to ask. How badly outnumbered are we going to be once the entire armada arrives? So badly it's not even worth thinking about, he said immediately, without even pausing to consider his answer. And the lack of concern in his tone pissed me off all over again. Then why the hell did you bring me up here, I asked? So you could have a quick father-son playdate before we both die horribly? I jerked a thumb at the shuttle. If we're doomed, just tell me right now. I'd rather fly that thing back home and die with my mother. She's all alone now, you realize. My father looked like I just got it in. And I felt a pang of regret, but it was mingled with a twisted sense of satisfaction. It felt good to hurt his feelings. It was payback for the way his choices had irrevocably damaged mine. It took my father a moment to respond. When he did, his voice had hardened. I didn't bring you up here, Lieutenant. You voluntarily enlisted as a soldier in the Earth Defense Alliance. You don't get to run home now just because you're scared. Trust me. I'm not scared, I said, lying right through my teeth. If that's true, then you're a fucking idiot, he said matter-of-factly. But I know that's not the case. 
He looked me in the eyes. I've been fighting this war for half of my life now, Zack, and I'm terrified. You don't know how long I've lived in fear of this day, and now it's here. You're not making me feel any better right now, I told him. I know that, Lieutenant. I also know how hopeless our chances must seem, given what you've been told, images you've been shown. But believe me, son, there are a lot of things about our situation and our energy that you still don't know. Enemy? Is there an enemy that you still don't know? He cast a glance back over his shoulder toward a large security camera mounted above the nearest exit, sweeping its lens slowly back and forth. Then he turned to me, and I think that was when I caught my first glimpse of something truly unsettling in my father's eyes, a hint of the very madness that I'd already feared, that I'd always feared I might have inherited from him. We can't talk now, or here, he said, lowering his voice to a whisper. But things aren't nearly as hopeless as they seem, Zack. I promise you. He gave me a hopeful smile. That's why I'm so thankful you're here now. I'm going to need your help. Despite my better judgment, judgment, I went ahead and asked, With what? With saving the world, son, my father said. You think you're up for that? I straightened my posture, and for the first time I noticed we were now the same height. Yes, sir, General Sir. Most definitely. There was no mistaking the look of pride on my father's face. It was intoxicating. I was hoping you said that, he said, patting me on the back. Follow me. He turned and began to jog back out through the hangar's exit. I cast another furtive glance back over my shoulder at the gleaming fighter ship stockpiled around me. Then I turned and ran after my father, even though I still wasn't quite exactly sure where he was leading me. As General Lightman led me through the dimly lit carpeted quarters of Moon Base Alpha, I kept biting the inner wall of my cheek every few minutes, minutes because each subsequent flash of pain was proof that I was wide awake and that this was all really happening. As we took a circuitous route to operations level, I marveled at how strangely familiar my new surroundings were and at how perfectly our modest simulated version of the Moon Base matched the real thing. When I mentioned to my father that it looked like a certain elements had been of the base had been borrowed bleh, certain elements of the base's exterior design had been borrowed from the fictional Clavius base seen in the two thousand in the film two thousand one A Space Odyssey, he was delighted to confirm that they had been. The team of engineers who designed and built this place were in a huge hurry hurry, so they borrowed from a lot of existing designs, he explained motioning to the carpeted corridors around us. They stole a lot of ideas from Sid Mead and Ralph, McQu Ralph McQuarrie, like everyone else. Everyone too, or uh, other people too, he grinned. The access corridors down on the maintenance level look like they were stolen right off the set of aliens, I swear. Wait until you see them. Once he told me all of that, I suddenly began to see evidence of sci-fi design theft everywhere I looked inside the base. Everything was sleek, ergonomic, and vaguely retro-futuristic in its design, which appeared to favor form over function. There were also a lot of vintage rock band and movie posters taped up everywhere, but I was pretty sure those had been added by the base's current residents, as had the graffiti spray-painted red on, the corridor, on one of the corridor walls, the cake is a lie. We also passed one corridor lined with, a do with dozens of framed photos of men and women in EDA flight uniforms wearing hairstyles from at least four different decades. Each photo was accompanied by a, s by a small plaque with the officer's name and two dates indicated the individual's term of service in the Earth Defense Alliance. This was followed by made the ultimate sacrifice to, pr to protect us all. All these people served up here? I asked my father. He nodded. And they died up here too, he said. Those are officers who lost their lives in the line of duty. But they were just drone pilots, right? How did they die? During previous attacks, the enemy has made it on this base. Has made on this base, he said. Then before I could ask him to elaborate, he said, I'll explain in the briefing. When we reached the end of that corridor, my father led me onto a turbo elevator that carried us 
onto the operations level, located over a mile beneath the, surface, the lunar surface in just a few seconds. Then my father led me through a series of cavernous chambers carved into the lunar bedrock, which housed cold fusion generators, life support systems, matter compilers, and the enormous gravity distortion array. I don't know how most of this stuff works, my father confessed, or how to operate most of it, but I've never needed to, because all of the base's systems are completely automated, and all of the maintenance is done by drones operated by real people back on Earth. When we passed the glass walls, the glass-walled med bay, I saw that, too, was staffed entirely by drones. The base doctor appeared to be a specially equipped aethid with a pair of articulated human hands that allowed a surgeon back on Earth to operate them remotely. A doctor in London used one of those med drones to remove my appendix a few years ago. The procedure went flawlessly. The crew quarters were packed onto the same level, 50 modular dorms, each designed for two residents. Since only three of the rooms are currently occupied, everyone gets their own private digs, my father said. He pointed to a door labeled Alpha 7. These are your quarters. The door has already been coded to your biometrics, and your pack should already be inside. I held up my QCOM checking and, and checked the countdown timer. Why even bother giving me a room? The Vanguard arrives in just a few hours. It's not like I'm going to take a nap between now and then. No, he said smiling, but you might want some privacy later once you're able to call your mother. I stared at him until he met my eyes. Are you planning to call her? He shook his head. I doubt that would be a good idea, he said. Why would she be interested in speaking to me when she finds out I'm alive and that I abandoned you both? Of course she'll want to talk to you, I told him. She'll be overjoyed to, sound, to find out you're alive. Then I added, without thinking, just like I am. He studied my face. You really think so? I know so, I said, although I was trying to convince myself as much as him. She never got over losing you. She never fell in love again after you. She told me so. My father suddenly turned away, and I heard a small noise escape him, like a small, like the sound of a wounded animal caught in a trap. When he made no other attempt to reply, I motioned to the other doors lining the corridor. Which room is yours? I asked. He pointed to the first door at the end of the hall labeled Alpha One. But that's not part of the tour, he said, attempting to steer me in the opposite direction. Just let me peek inside for one second, I said, standing my ground. Please, sir? There really isn't much to see, he said, still interposing himself between me and the door. Judging by his reaction, there was clearly a lot to see, and I was determined to see it. I didn't move. Our standoff continued for a dozen or so seconds before the general finally stepped aside and palmed the door his face already flashing red in embarrassment as I squeezed past him to peer inside the tiny modular room. The entire back wall of my father's quarters was covered with photos of me and my mom, including all of my yearbook photos going back to grade school, a photo of my mother in her nurse's uniform, which he must have found on her hospital's website, was hanging over his bed. The rest of his walls were completely bare. Before I could examine his living space further, he prodded me back out of it into the hall and locked the door. Hurry, he said, trying to hide the unsteadiness in his voice. Every second counts.